Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 428 featuring Jeff Barnes, who many of you may know as one of the co-founders of Cafe FX. Uh, of course, unfortunately, Cafe FX is no longer around, but their legacy and history is amazing. And we get to talk to Jeff about that. He is currently the executive vice president and creative development over at uh, Lightfield Labs doing some fascinating work, which we get into. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, Jeff uh, did found Cafe FX. We talk about that, how that happened. Uh, we talk about uh, the struggles of running a visual effects studio out of Santa Maria, California, um, which was also interesting. Uh, they've done some incredible work. Uh, you know, they worked on uh, Armageddon Flubber, but it was, it was very interesting how he sort of told us that that panic room was the thing that sort of put them on the map uh, and really got everyone's attention, which was really cool. Uh, he briefly worked at Digital Domain at the same time that I was there, um, which was a little fun to talk about that. Uh, but then we also obviously get into Lightfield Labs and what Lightfield Labs is and how, uh, the kind of work that they do. They're doing some incredibly sophisticated uh, display systems that allow you to visualize uh, an entire uh, light field in three dimensions uh, through a special kind of display. And it's kind of fascinating to hear that story and that history behind that. So really cool talking to Jeff. I was very, very glad to, to finally get the, that story recorded because I think that uh, the kind of stuff that he has done has been really kind of amazing. Uh, and especially all the work that he did over at Cafe FX. And obviously, we're very much looking forward to seeing what the stuff they're doing over at Lightfield Lab. Uh, okay, we got a couple of product announcements, some big ones. V-Ray 6.1 for Maya is out. Uh, it's got a lot of new features in it that you should check out amongst what well, some of them are uh, scattered. There's a new feature called Bump to Glossiness, which is really cool. Uh, enhanced procedural clouds. Uh, we lots and lots of speed ups, including enhanced denoiser and upscaling through uh, the new NVIDIA AI systems that have been added. Uh, we also have a V-Ray 6.1 for Cinema 4D, and it also has a lot of those same features but also has we've added V-Ray tunes to, uh, uh, to Cinema 4D which is very cool as well so I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to checking that out so go go to chaos.com to check out all of our new updates again that is 6.1 for Maya and 6.1 for C4D so really exciting V-Ray news on that side of things a uh, couple of events that we can uh, you can check out uh, if you want to see us there we will be at these uh, to check out all of our events just go to chaos dot com slash events but more specifically june 9th uh, 6th through 9th we will be at aia in san francisco and june 11th through 13th we will be at neocon in chicago again go to chaos.com slash events to check out all of our upcoming events all right if you guys want to know more about the podcast you can always go to our website chaos.com slash uh, cg garage uh, we also have a facebook page which is facebook.com slash cg garage podcast um, and if you want to watch this podcast which i always recommend you can go to our YouTube, which is youtube.com slash chaos group TV. And all, all the chaos group, uh, all the chaos uh, videos are uploaded there, but we put all of our podcasts there as well. Of course, if you have any ideas, which we've been getting some really good ones recently, uh, or, and suggestions, uh, just go to labs at chaos.com. We'd love to know more, uh, more suggestions. Of course, you can always leave us a comment or anything else you want to do. Uh, talk to us about that. So, which would be great. Again, that is labs at chaos.com. But for now, please enjoy episode number 400. 128 with Mr. Jeff Barnes. Welcome to another CG Garage where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. All right. So, Jeff, thank you. Thank you so much for, 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 for being on. I've actually been a big fan of your work for many, many, many years. So uh, uh, it's always nice to sort of get to know you a little bit more as we go. But, uh, but being able to actually hear your, your story, I think, is really interesting and important uh, because I've, you've done a lot to the industry uh, in many different ways, uh, at many different levels. But before we get into that, what is, how did you first get interested in CG and uh, filmmaking in general? Well, uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, it it's, it's good to still be relevant <laughs> <laughs> to some degree. So I appreciate you ask, asking me to join the podcast. Um, I'm a fan of the podcast and um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here. 
so, you know, I, I let's see, uh, trying to make a long story, not too much longer. Um, <laughs> I'm from Pennsylvania and I went to college and majored in, they called it radio TV film at a place called Shippensburg in central Pennsylvania. Uh, it was a concentration versus a minor in business. Um, so I always kind of knew I wanted to get into the industry, but I wasn't really sure how, quite frankly. So uh, after I graduated, um, my girlfriend dumped me and um, I really didn't have any reason to stay there besides my lovely family. So I came out to visit a friend in Santa Cruz and uh, I had bartended through college, so I got a job bartending right away and fell in love with California. Um, and then through bartending, I met uh, the team, the producing team that did, um, uh, what was the uh, Kiefer Sutherland Dracula movie when they were younger? Um, I'm blanking oh, on uh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm blanking on it. So they had produced that movie and they were producing other films. So. I got to meet the producer and so forth. And I talked to them about, um, you know, my interest in the industry and wasn't quite sure how to break in. And so they gave me a PA job uh, on, on a couple of the movie. They were called movies of the week back then. I don't know if you remember that uh -huh. before all the TTs were out and, you know, you could binge. And so, so, you know, the networks would do a movie of the week. So I worked as a PA on a couple of those. And then, um, and then uh, the Kyoto brothers came in and did killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> Um, uh, which doesn't get better than that. And so I was no. a, PA, a PA on that film. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, and, you know, it started just meeting a bunch of people and talking to them about being part of the industry. Uh, and then I had an offer to move to L.A. and be in live action. And I kind of, I don't know, something just didn't quite feel right on that side. So I, I ended up passing on that and then got a job at a local TV station up there in Salinas, KSBW, and um, which ended up being really great for me because it got me to um, start editing uh, and uh, as a PA there as well. But I got to learn a little bit of everything from news um, to uh, post production to you know editorial. At that time, it was film. Went from film to one inch, one inch to three quarter. Um, uh, they never had uh, nonlinear editing up there, but uh, I fell in love with the editorial process and the graphic process. Long story short, when I took a job down uh, where I'm still, where I still live today in Santa Maria at KCOY, a CBS affiliate, as a, a post-production editor, promotion editor, and right. um, ended up being an editor. Uh, it, they had a beta suite. It was like a CMX style editing system at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we were the first beta suite in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. So we did all the commercial work and I really fell in love with the design and graphics aspect of it and put a proposal together to the station to try to um, uh, become a more full service production entity with animation. And they turned it down. Uh, and then somebody told me about there, there's this young kid in town. He was like 17 years old that was playing with this thing called an Amiga computer. And uh, so I went over to visit him one day, and uh, uh, that was his name was David Ebner, and David ended up being my partner and helping helping uh, me launch the company. Right. And we started very small, two guys in a garage, two guys in a one room. And he was seventeen miles. at the time. He was like seventeen or eighteen at the time. He was very young. And how old um, were you? <laughs> I was like seventy. No, I think I was like uh, I was late twenties okay. at that time. Right. So we we're like about a ten year difference, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, but David was this this whiz kid, and he was just kind of doing local soccer videos. And because I was at the station, you know, I was able to, you know, uh, bring, you know, some better clients. So we formed this partnership and we used to go. This is before, you know, you could put anything to a hard drive or anything like that. We worked a deal out with the station. We'd go in overnight. We had one of the engineers build like a little a macro trigger for us and we'd single frame to beta tape. Um, animations for the commercials, right? Um, so that's how it all really started. Uh, and uh, and I really loved broadcast, actually, design and broadcast. So a Computer Cafe slash Cafe FX actually started as kind of a local, um, local commercial, you know, just doing local commercials and broadcast work. We ended up doing station packaging. Then we kind of went to station packaging doing station IDs and then full news packages, you know, graphics for, and we ended up doing them for all the stations in the market pretty much. And then Bakersfield. And we had a, we found a rep firm in LA that got us jobs in Florida and so forth. So 
we were kind of a broadcast company first. Huh. Uh, any questions on that part? No, uh, I mean, it's fascinating. So, but it was, a, it was just the two of you for a long time? It was the two of us actually officially on paper. Da- David's mom gave us a 10 grand loan and said, I need that back in six months. And we did that. Um, and we bought, we had a, a, I think we had two Amigas and a VHS deck. Right. Uh, that's how we started. And then uh, right at, right about that same time, I had met a guy from Cuesta College up in San Luis Obispo named Ron Hahn. And Ron wasn't a partner, but he, kind, he, he is basically. He joined us right away. And Ron was our art director. Ron was the guy that could really draw well and a great creative concept guy. And um, he teaches at Florida State now, just awesome person. And right. uh, uh, so we brought Ron on. And so uh, we got our first big our first big contract was with Foster's Freeze, um, which was yes. a headquarter that was up by us. And we got like, I tell the story, I think we got 15 spots over two years for 30 grand. And we thought we, you know, we'd hit the big time and we were <laughs> for life kind of thing. Um, and so we did those spots and we ended up doing uh, some other uh, notable spots for that the Amiga highlight. We did the first Amiga national commercial done in Amiga on a desktop computer uh, at that time. For, it was for Shasta Soda for one of the bowl games. And then a, a local gentleman in Lompoc named Tom Williamson came on board. And um, Tom had a lot of experience in Los Angeles as a makeup effects artist. He worked for Altarian Studios and all the big makeup effects studios. So Tom had connections um, within that world. So, so he came in and, and helped us kind of get into the feature world, which our first feature was um, on Lord of Illusions with Clive Barker. Wow. There was no, uh, so he knew the supervisor. He had worked with him on another film. And, uh, you know, he, the, so the supervisor was interested. And so, but there was no, um, you know, stuff was, the only way you could do things in the industry at that point, it was still early days, was on Silicon Graphic Workstations on Wayfront or something like right. that. Just to give people an idea, what, 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 uh, around what year was this that it all started? Like 1993, 94. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, we used to tease the guys at, at uh, Wayfront. We'd, we'd sleep, sleep by their dumpsters to try to, you know, get anything that they threw out. Because those workstations at that time, they were 60, 70 grand. Yep. Um, and, uh, and that software. So it wasn't cheap. It was the barrier to entry was pretty steep. So, uh, you know, I think the timing with, uh, with um, the, the Amiga... And specifically, toaster, video toaster, mm-hmm. um, light wave. So we were, you know, we were one of the early light wave houses. Um, and so, you know, as a result of that, uh, oh, sorry. So as a result of that, then, um, uh, so Tom pitched uh, that supervisor at the time was named Tom Renoni. Um, and so we we didn't we wanted he said they had some wire removals they could get us in on right because that was starting to become a thing. Yep. You know, in the old days, you didn't remove wires; you just kept them in. <laughs> We didn't know since we didn't have anything it was hard to show anything right? right so we knew the rocketeer the movie the rocketeer had been shot across the street at the um santa maria airport mm-hmm. we found out that uh uh some of the one of the guys that was a fan of the movie said there's a shot where the plane gets drug across the tarmac and there's a big wire in it you can see it sure so we went to the local laser disc store there was a late no this is before dvds you know blu-rays right, all right, that right. stuff so went to the laser disc store got a laser disc we um recorded the shot we showed the before and after so it kind of made our own that was we wouldn't say this you know mm-hmm. and then we ran that to la and they gave us our first three shots in the film industry uh, yep. based on a laser disc scan and a wire removal <laughs> that's that's great i mean i guess at that time also it's like I was like, yeah, you can do this. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were like, and then, you know, the guys, you know, I, I, I you know, I was kind of the editor, business manager, producer sure. of, of the, of the facility. And, you know, those guys were the, the guys on the boxes and, um, uh, you know, we stayed up all night, uh, and we used to call it sneaker net and everything was on floppy drives Yep. and we, we were running floppies between the systems to, to get the shots done we turned it around in record time and then they gave us a couple more shots and i think we had like five shots in the movie or something at the end i can't remember but and they gave us beyond remire like a little effect shot that we did and 
so that's how it all started. That's amazing. That's amazing. So that's your first feature. Now, how did, did that start to open doors for you guys? Yeah. So at the same, like we, we had a couple different verticals we were going down. Like I was saying, we, we were working heavily into the broadcast industry. Sure. We had found reps down in Los Angeles to rep us on that side. So we were doing stuff for turn. We started doing stuff for Turner network. We, we broke out of the local market, Great. started to do some stuff. They got us jobs for Turner network and for, you know, various, again, these various TV uh, news packages with like Miami and different different places like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were doing we were doing a lot of that work. Uh, but then you know after we did the film job, um, you know, uh, word was starting to get out that you know we do a little bit of this stuff, and we didn't have any money. Like we were in a we went from a <laughs> I tell the story is kind of funny. We went from a ten by ten room for a hundred bucks a month. We got busy, so we expanded across the hall. We were subletting from a design company. Across the hall, they gave us a 10 by 15 room. We were there for four months. Money got tight, so we went back into the 10 by 10 room to save 50 bucks a month, right? So, right. You know, t- tough days back then, right? Um, uh, but then t- the, the supervisor that worked on Lord of Illusions, he got his next film, which was called Star Kid at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a little fantasy movie about a kid that um, befriends a robot, gets inside a robot and, and an alien robot. Anyway, we, we went from like three to five shots. We ended up doing 200 shots on that movie. And it was, you know, ended up being almost over a million bucks contract, I think, at the time. So we went from, you know, little 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollar jobs to uh, a million bucks. And, we, and it enabled us to expand from four people. I think we grew to like eight people or something like that and then did that over you know a period of about a year and a half and we finished 200 shots and all of a sudden we had a reel now for feature work so yeah so we kept going we kept going down that path i would go down to la with a bad clip on tie and a box full of vhs tapes and i would sit in the lobbies of all these uh post-production facilities and um you know tried to pitch and the studio studios would hardly ever see us at that time but right um, uh you know just try to get to post-production supervisors and stuff and slowly but surely after a couple of years we just started getting more and more work um the other thing that we did that was very instrumental is back in the back in the day um they used to and i don't know if they still do this now but you know the industry magazines post magazine specifically millimeter post um those kinds of publications they would put screenshots in of you know stuff that you did and you didn't have to pay for it they would you would just send them in so we were pretty diligent about that we would put we would send them everything right and um uh so we had a screenshot of little foster our little ice cream cone guy that pdi ended up seeing and the executive producer of pdi called us because they were doing the pillsbury doughboy at the time uh-huh. and, so, you know, we were, we were kind of firing on all fronts. Listen, being in Santa Maria, believe it or not, and this is hard to believe, is not the hub for entertainment. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's a nice uh, little wine country, though. <laughs> yes, we love living up here, but it was tough. And, and you know, back, back then, uh, being three hours outside of L.A., was, you could have been in Mars. You right. know, people just really, they weren't, they weren't talking. They didn't understand this Internet thing. Um, they just, people just didn't under, understand how there was, there was a meeting, um, that we went to a couple of years, even a couple of years later, we were in Santa Monica. It was for one of the networks. It was for a, a series and we had this great meeting with them. I was there with Ron and there was like eight people around a table and, you know, we showed them demos. We did some artwork. They were, they were really impressed. They were, you know, ready to sign on. And the director said, um, so where in Santa Monica are you guys? And we said, no, we're not in Santa Monica. We're in Santa Maria. And it was like, all of a sudden we were in the parking lot. It was like, how did, how did we, how did we get out of here? You know, it was like, <laughs> it was like bewitched or something, you know, we went from like, so they, people just didn't want to work out of town back then. Right. Um, so that was a, that was always a struggle for us, but we, uh, I think later it worked in our benefit, but initially we just, that's where we lived and where we wanted to stay. Um, yeah, it must have been hard to like recruit talent as well. It's like it was very, it was very difficult. We actually, you know, I just did an advisory board meeting with our local college, Hancock College, up here um, on the advisory board for their their arts and film 
um, uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a we had an instructor over there who has since passed, but he was amazing. We would meet with him because he taught 3D. Mm. So back in that time, you know, so a lot of our staff were right out of college or even some out of high school local. Um, and then uh, we also did a lot of recruiting globally at that time. Um, we found that uh, this was before 9-11 and, you know, uh, but we, we just found that that a lot, it, it was good to have a mix mixture of cultures sure. that helped creatively to have that kind of creative think tank of different kind of cultures because they looked at solving problems and come up coming up with creative solutions in a in a more global sensibility versus just like all your animators from new york or all your animators or your designers from la you know it was really nice to have that and they were really excited about coming to the states and working so we would sponsor visas for for these uh these young people and bring them over and we we just for a small company in santa maria we had an incredibly eclectic mix of talent um and uh yeah so we uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll stop for a second. I can keep talking. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's all good. Listen, this is fascinating. Uh, no, I, I'm very interested. I mean, obviously, you guys have uh, grew to become quite reputable and, and very, very talented in, in terms of what you guys did. But I, I do remember it was like, oh, they're doing such great work. It's like, oh, but I would have to move to Santa Maria. <laughs> right, right, right. That was like, well, and, and, and in the late 90s, so... We were like, listen, uh, we want to stay here, but let's look at moving to L.A. Right. Let's look at what we need to do to get to L.A., especially because we were doing features and we were doing commercials now, sure. too. So we features, commercials, broadcast commercials. You know, people wanted you to have a flame or an inferno right. and they wanted to do the, you know, the ad agency interactivity thing. Right. And so. Uh, but we didn't have the funds <laughs> to do it still. You know, you would have thought, but we, it, we were just super conservative Back in those days, we paid cash for everything. Like we were just really, really conservative, <coughs> and we um, uh, we hired a consultant to help us assess it, and so forth and so on. Uh, and we ended up going to there was a facility called Five Two Five Post mm. in Hollywood at the time. I don't know if mm -hmm. you were around or remember that them, but they were the premier facility for. Uh, like music videos, they had all the big clients like, you know, Paul McCartney and Madonna. I mean, you just name it. And they were coming through 525. They they did amazing work. Right. Uh, and a compositing house. So we and this first, is back when music videos were like a big deal, right? They were a big thing. Right. Um, Fincher was doing them and all that stuff. Everybody, right. everybody, right? They just left and right. And then, uh, so, well, b before that, we were getting some work from Post Logic. Uh, which was yep. kind of right where the Capitol Records building. They, Dick Voss over there was very supportive of giving us a bunch of work. So that kind of helped us get into L.A. a little bit, but we hadn't moved down there, and he didn't have an opportunity for us to come in. And then 525, a gentleman named Steve Hendricks, who ran 525 at the time, um, and Bob Coleman, some people know Bob Coleman, yep. uh, they brought us in, and they said, listen, we'll rent you guys a room. Let's do a trade-out because we don't have CG. You guys don't do compositing. You do CG, we'll give you a room for free and we'll, you know, we'll kind of work out an arrangement. So we did that. Right. So we were actually inside 525 for a couple of years in Hollywood. And then they moved to Santa Monica. Right. Uh, Virgin, Virgin came in and uh, bought them. Okay. Um, Richard Branson's group, Virgin Entertainment. They bought them and then they moved to Santa Monica uh, and then we were like, yeah, and they weren't sure, you know, if they wanted to continue the relationship, not for any bad reason. It just, they had a new space and they were thinking of doing it. So we got our own space then in Santa Monica for a couple of years. Right. And then, and this was in the, this was 2000, I want to okay. say. Yep. And then, um, uh, and then we were getting some work, but we were mostly CG. We had no, had, didn't have the compositing relationship. So we, we had a bunch of our clients that were really kind of saying, bring, get compositing. So we were trying to find a place to rent again that had a flame. And there was a, uh, there was a facility called Pacific Ocean. It wasn't Post. Uh, that was somebody else. There was a, a different company known by a guy named Neil Feldman. And, and we went down and talked to Neil because he had a room available. And he said, he came up and said, I want to sell you guys the whole facility. We're like, and they he had two telecines and, uh, three flames and full, you know, full equipment room. We're like, yeah, we can't afford that. He's like, no, well, let's, let's talk about it. Long story short, we did it. 
we it was a big dive for us. Um, uh, but we 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 took it over, and we knew we weren't um, experienced enough to deal with the commercial clientele or telesyne at that that level. Right. So the gentleman that introduced us was Les Sorrentino, who I'd met at PostLogic years ago, and uh, Kenny Solomon, who used to run Western Images up in San Francisco, and Bo Leon, who was a top colorist uh, in Los Angeles at the time. I think he was at Riot at the time. Mm-hmm. So they, we brought them on as, uh, as junior partners and they helped us rebrand and launch the syndicate. And um, right. so the syndicate then became our short form commercial division. Yep. And uh, we had CG upstairs, so to speak, uh, but we did telecine and commercial and, and David Wong did design and, and, uh, did some just incredible, those guys did an amazing, amazing job with the, with the company and incredible work. And, um, and then together between the two entities, we just, we just exploded. I mean, and that um, was in on fourth street, right? In Santa Monica. That was on, uh, four, yeah, fourth and Wilshire. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. yeah, yeah. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We ended up doing, and then what happened was we were trying to keep the entity separate features and, but, you know, a lot of the feature clients, because of the convenience down there, then they started, you know, wanting to go through that office. So we had a cafe contingency up there. Um, we also had syndicate artists. So we ended up kind of just mixing the whole thing near the end, mixing everything together. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, and at the end, you know, uh, I think we did almost 90 features at the end of the day and uh you know and how many people did you have in santa maria and how many people did you have in santa monica yeah it's a good question i i I, at the end i just remember from the overhead numbers (laughs) (laughs) at the end we had between the two facilities we had about 200 people right something like that uh somewhere in that uh syndicate the la office i should say syndicate office uh, was hovering around 75 right and um up in santa maria we were somewhere around, uh, yeah, buck and a quarter or something like that for gotcha. people up there. And, and we had in t- 2006, we had moved from our little offices where we were slow, slowly expanding to we bought a large building on campus and put in a bowling alley and volleyball and all this crazy stuff. We were super, <laughs> we were super, super culture centric. I mean, it right. was really, really important for us. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So what so let's what were some of your favorite features to to work on some of the big projects that you guys worked on during that time? Um well, you know, there's there's uh you know, there are some that I like more than others for different reasons. There there's also some that were I'll just I'll just go over the pivotal ones for the company sure, first. Sure. That's okay. I'll try to touch on those. So Lord of Illusions being the first one. Yep. Star Kid being the first big one. And then there's a gentleman in Santa Maria whose name is Phil Norwood, and Phil's arguably one of the best storyboard artists in the world. He's worked at ILM and all the best. Yeah, it's like people like Santa Maria. This guy's just amazing. And Phil was always over and giving us advice, and he, you know, just amazing um, creative talent. And we ended up bringing him in as an art director for a few years later down the line. But Phil was working on this movie for Disney up in the Bay Area called Flubber. Right. And, uh, uh, Phil said, they're having some problems with one of the vendors. Do you want to do uh, a test? And we're like, sure. So we did this test in the office of Weibo, the character, and we sent it up there. We didn't hear anything for, for weeks, like nothing. Then we get a call. I got a call from the producer one night of the film saying, who are you guys? You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, he's like, we'd like to come up and have you come up and meet us. So we came up, we met them, we met the director, met Robin Williams, the whole thing. And uh, uh, they were really impressed and they, um, they brought us on. So that was our first big feature, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like big studio feature. Uh, the story I don't tell too often, but uh, out of that, um, John Hughes was the producer writer of Flubber. Uh-huh. And uh, he was so impressed with, he had heard, he he stayed in Chicago. John didn't really like L.A. He would stay in Chicago. Sure. That he, he actually flew my partner and I out to meet him for lunch in Chicago one day, and uh, we they had uh, him and his his partner Ricardo Mestres. Ricardo I think started Hollywood Pictures. They were then gonna uh, they were looking at buying the, buying us. Wow! So it went from like a test to somebody like John Hughes buying our company it was. 
super, super exciting for right. us. We kind of, we kind of were stunned by the whole thing. Um, it didn't work out. Uh, John and Ricardo ended up having a, 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 a breakup and they went different directions that, uh, but it was, it was really cool. So, so that was a huge film in terms of those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Then, um, let's see what else. Uh, I'm, I, then I guess the next one was Armageddon. When we went into 525, mm -hmm. they were doing, uh, with Francis Lawrence, they were doing the I Don't Want to Miss a Thing video um, uh, with, you know, Steven Tyler's daughter yeah. and the whole thing. <laughs> Steven Tyler. And we worked on that. And we did um, that. And uh, at the same time, they had feature shots. So we did uh, the gantry, dual gantry liftoff shots with, it was the first time we dealt with volumetrics, volumetrics on that level. Right. We did and all that stuff so we did a bunch of shots for armageddon that ended up being on our reel so that that was another very important important project for those us. were amazing shots i remember how pinnacle they were at that time that the smoke yeah and they stuff were was... big we, we uh, they ended up using them in a lot of their press and everything yep. so you know that was a super super pinnacle project for us um Another one that a few years later, again, I get these time frames a little. I think, and uh, uh, Brandon Davis was one of the guys who worked on that. Yeah, it? yeah, we brought Brandon, you know Brandon? I do, very well. Oh, yeah, Br we brought Brandon in for that. Another guy named Brett Patton. Those guys really, they they kind of, they kicked that. Yeah, Brandon was our first uh, fluids particles. Yep. Particle, and he was on uh, 3D Studio Max at yep. the time, using Max for that. Um, and then uh, I would say the next... I'm sure I'm missing some in here, but the next one that was really uh, pivotal for us was Panic Room. Oh, so wow. um, uh, we worked with Kevin Haug, uh, who was a visual effects supervisor. I don't know if you know Kevin mm. on, a, on a few films, I believe, before that. Um, and uh, Kevin had heard about, oh, I know what it was. I, I was so impressed because having this broadcast design love I was so impressed with the work that Kyle Cooper did with Fincher on Seven, um, right. the opening title sequence. I don't know if you remember that. It was the first time they really like used distress type and you know uh, different things that you would normally do, put in a commercial or a broadcast situation. Yeah. They were actually uh, they actually used in a feature, and right. uh, and got a lot of awards and accolades. For it. I just thought it was fantastic. So I was like, I I really want to I really want to work with Fincher on an opening title sequence. So. Yep. That's that's what it was. So I kind of researched next film, contacted Kevin. We went down, had some meetings. We pitched him on it, and um, he liked our visual. He goes, "I'm going to give you guys some visual effects. Title, you guys have done some great work, but you haven't done a major title sequence." Right. So there was another group called the Picture Mill, who's still in in business today, yep. and Bill Levita over there. He's like, "We're talking to Picture Mill, but they don't have the CG chops that they need. What if I put you guys together?" Uh, to pitch to David and, and we're like so we went down met those guys we we loved them we had a great and we ended up pitching them and we got the job and that's, uh, yeah that's an yeah. important title sequence <laughs> it was a very important and it got so much press i mean we were getting calls from all over the world to be on interviews we ended up being entertainment uh we were in entertainment weekly as like 100 most creative people blah, blah, and we got on a Microsoft ad and Vanity Fair and Wired Mag, like just all this press from this title sequence. That's awesome. Um, I mean, David, it was all David, right. you know, it's this genius. It wasn't, you know, we were just executing it quite right. frankly, but, but you know, we took the press because, you know, it just, that, that helped us. But, um, but it was a great experience working with Bill at Picture Mill was a great experience. And that was, that really, I, I tell people, you know, people used to, hang up when we'd say Santa Maria, like people were taking after that movie and that press got up, people were taking our calls, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was interesting. It wasn't for the effects, which I thought we did a great job on the effects. I think we did like 40 effect shots. We did, uh, there's CG leaves and more particle system stuff and right. all sorts of, you know, various support visual effects on it, but that people just love those titles. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was, that was really a big one. And then, uh, probably the next, the next one was, uh, we ended up, we were, we worked on spy kids with Robert Rodriguez. Yeah. Um, we did spy kids too. I don't remember how we got on that anymore. And then, uh, so we flew to Austin, we met Robert and he really, he liked, um, he liked the work, but it was, he was funny. He, 
because he's kind of a rebel in his own right. Yep. He loved that we weren't in Hollywood. It was like the first time that, you know, somebody came to us, a director and said, I love you're not, that you're not down there. And he's like, I'm not there. I'm in Austin. Like, I love that you guys, you know, have kind of put a stake in, you know, where you want to live. And so he, he, he loved that. So, uh, so we worked on Spy Kids with him. And then um, we did Shark Boy Lava Girl, which yep. that was kind of a crazy film, uh, which was our first 3D film. Oh, uh, right. Stereoscopic film. So that was important. Uh, but uh, even more so, then we worked on Sin City. And right. uh, the three companies he chose um, uh, to work on. So we each had a chapter, like a 45 minute chapter for Sin City. I don't know if you remember the film that yeah, much, yeah, yeah. but it was one of the first, it was like that and 300 were one of the first and, and Sky Captain uh, right. were one of the first films that were all green screen. Right. So yep. that's the, you know, that was, that was kind of important, but we did, uh, we did 45 minutes. We did a whole chapter on that orphanage did 45 minutes. Yep. And, um, uh, I'm just blanking. The guys in Montreal. Um, oh. Game company. No. Uh, anyway, yeah. they did a hybrid. Hybrid effects did for. But he picked all those companies because they weren't in L.A. Right. Right. That's, you know. Uh, it's and, almost like uh, like you're not corrupted by Hollywood yet. So Right. Right. <laughs> right. Interesting. And he would fly up and had lunch with us and we'd barbecue and just, you know, such a nice guy. And um uh, so, so that was, that was great. And we also did very well on those films. Yeah. Um, and it enabled us to, it, we were, we were bursting at the seams, enabled us to, to finally buy our own building and kind of move, right. move across the street. And then, um, after that, uh, after we had moved, we were trying to set up a, a, a character, a bigger character pipeline. And we got a job, uh, on the mist. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Before the mist, we did snakes on a plane oh yes yeah Wonderful. I mean, if you talk about being proud of a film damn it uh and i do need, i do need to mention eric henry was the visual effects supervisor on snakes on a plane okay and god bless eric eric was one of the first supervisors to embrace us i think we worked on like six projects with eric over the years amazing eric henry and the other eric eric durst who's uh, just won a ves award for yep. days at memorial that, like those guys, were, they were they loved that we were up there, and they were super supportive, and they just kept bringing us work. So I just wanted to give them a nod because without them, I, I don't know if we would have made it, you know. But uh, awesome. so we worked on Snakes on a Plane with Eric um, and uh, Steve, uh, oh, Janet Muswell, who's now at HBO, and Steve Dellerson, and uh, so we worked on Snakes, and at this about the same time, we got Pan's Labyrinth. Because we had worked with uh, Guillermo on Hellboy a few years before, gotcha. And he he liked it, and he had he had the script that he sent us that said, you know, I don't really have much money for it. I've been trying to get this thing made. Would you guys kind of partner with me on it? Um, and uh, we had also just launched our pro our production entity called Sententia, and uh, we wanted to get associate producer credit on it. So we kind of agreed to do that under the auspices, but. I'll be honest with you. I mean, uh, I, I we we didn't think anybody outside, you know, half a dozen people in Spain and Mexico would have seen Pans, and it ended up being. I heard I heard that you guys didn't realize how big this movie was going to be. We all liked the script, and we were like, "Wow, it's amazing!" But you know, it was low budget, and he really didn't have any money. I mean, we we invested um, a lot of time and money in that beyond what, what we got paid on that film. Right. Uh, but if I have to say, you know, like, what's my favorite film that we worked on? It would be Pans, I yeah. think. Um, uh, I think because uh, we, he, did, you know, he gave us some creative control with designing the fairies and so forth, and it just was just this amazing film. Um, it's just something that we're all we're all very very proud of, uh, and we were we were proud of most of the projects that we worked on. We worked on some amazing things. The the other one that was. Frank Darabon, um, Frank, who, uh, you know, wrote and directed Shawshank Redemption and, you know, all of Stephen, mostly all of Stephen King stuff, Green Mile. Mm -hmm. Frank did this film called The Mist. Frank came to us after talking to Guillermo and uh, that was really fun too. And we did a bunch of creatures with Frank, loved working with him. Um, and then 
to kind of round it out. Uh, we worked on uh, the, a lot of most people don't know this because we were on kind of a gag order for such a long time. We worked on the Harry Potter ride. Oh, uh, right. In Santa Maria. And um, we actually uh, uh, it was one of the first times that um, they had projected inside um, domes. They were kind of like the top of a silo. Um, uh, so the animators had to figure out all sorts of custom lens shaders and different things in order to, we call it squinching, to fit the image inside a dome because you were, you were also on KUKA arms now. Was, I think they've done that a lot more for different rides now, but at the time, KUKA arms are those big arms that they use to build cars you yep. know, in Detroit. But they had, I think it may have been the first ride where they were actually you know, integrating that into a ride and the KUKA arm would come around and then, you know, put you inside the dome. Mm -hmm. So you were immersed when you had these, you know, these various video clips. So, uh, so that was just an awesome project just cause it was Potter and it was a ride and it's really cool. And then, you know, I would, and then we ended up with Alice before we closed, which was both a blessing and a curse all at the same time. Right. Um, it was the, it was a massive project. It was, wrought with challenges on all sorts of different levels. Um, uh, I was very proud of our work, but it was a very, very tough job. And it was the one that we decided afterwards, you know, we're going to, we're going to spin it down. Right. You know. I mean, that must've been the hardest thing, right. For you to, what, that, that challenge of like, this isn't, can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a tough industry, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, I was fortunate enough to be chair of the VES in 2008, I think it was. And we had a lot of discussions at that time. Um, a lot of people were call like a lot of people were feeling the stress of the industry at that time. That's when I think that's, I mean, globalization had been around for a while, but it was really starting to take hold. Facilities were moving um, out of country. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, will Hollywood facilities make it? Mm -hmm. Um, we had, we traveled, uh, I had traveled to a bunch of different places, but, you know, tax incentivized zones, countries, states to try to figure out if we wanted to pick up and move. And I think we waited too long, quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, uh, in order to make that judgment, but between low labor markets in Asia at that time and the incentives, uh, it was just really tough. And we, we, through the VES, we had meetings where we met, you know, that we put together that where we met with, you know, all the visual effects heads at all the studios. And, you know, we tried to see if there was any way around this. But it was tricky because with the Visual Effects Society, it's a global organization. Yep. And um, uh, so as chair or as representing that organization, you have to be thoughtful and careful about not leaning too heavily toward, you know, your own like Los Angeles oriented sure. companies. Actually the, the VES LA section was born out of that challenge. Actually, it's like, right. we, need a, we need a separate group to do that. So, Interesting. uh, sorry, long winded way of answering your question. No, uh, this is great. I mean, I think it's really, really interesting to do that. And now I know you after, after cafe, uh, uh, sh uh, shut down, what you were floating around, you were doing several, uh, other little visual effects jobs here and there. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, uh, I kind of, I, I consulted, I guess, with mm -hmm. the way I like, like your stints at places. I, uh, I, I kind of, it, it was, uh, it was exhausting closing the company down. We, we didn't want to do that thing where people came in and found the doors locked and didn't have paychecks. And right. so, you know, we, we let everybody know ahead of time. We worked with our banks for six months ahead of time. We, you know, um, so everybody, you know, got paid in, in full, as far as I know, <laughs> and we negotiated with any, you know, creditors for anything. And so it took like two years of spinning it down, quite frankly. Wow. Um, so, uh, so once that was over, it just needed kind of a cocktail and, uh, <laughs> and a little, <laughs> and a little breathing time. So I ended up just consult doing some marketing stuff, consulting for people up, up locally up here in, in different factions. And then, um, and then uh, we had we had done some commercial work back in the day for Will Vinton Studios, um, which Will Vinton, uh, I don't know if you know about Will. Will was kind of a premier animator. He used to do the California Raisins yeah. stuff in the day. And up in Portland. So we, 
We were, yeah, up in Portland. We were a subcontractor for them. And we worked with uh, a guy named David Daniels, who David's just a genius. David um, uh, was the guy that kind of basically did all the M&M's commercials in the early days and moved it to Lightwave. And so we worked on some things with David. So when um, when Vinton's got uh, uh, bought by Phil Knight's team um, for Travis Knight and they mm-hmm. formed Leica, mm-hmm. There was a faction of people that didn't like of that. <laughs> a lot of bad jokes. Yeah. Um, and formed a company called Bent Image Labs up there, which right. is kind of a multimedia disciplinary uh, company that did lots, did, still did stop, did phenomenal work. If you go online, you can see how great their work is. Uh, but they were they were looking at getting heavy, more heavily into visual effects and and some AR uh, an AR division. So I went up there and kind of worked with them for a, a little bit. Oh, before that, sorry, before that, I got a job at uh, Digital Domain. I was at Digital Domain for about a year and a half. Um, I was based out of Venice, but I was covering, I was uh, uh, overseeing their stereo and VFX in Florida. And uh, Oh, wow. This is So this was uh, during 2.0, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, 1.8, maybe. I'm, yeah, okay, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. So, because I was out there, and then honestly, that whole thing just ended up being a mess and blowing up, and then they declared bankruptcy. Yep. So, so that that was that was like a year and a half to almost two years. It was uh, kind of short lived. I was um, in the I was in Venice <laughs> while that oh, was you going. Were? On. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I I had an office in Venice. Right. Um, I remember. There, <laughs> right. Right. Out, do you remember right yeah. outside the main just there in that little trailer out mm-hmm. there? Um, so. Uh, met some great people, you know, uh, it was, it was an interesting experience. Sure. Um, and then I worked at, there's a little, uh, post facility in Hollywood called Cognition kind of went there for a year, helped them kind of looked at VFX and they, they ended up kind of doing more, um, ph- photogrammetry scanning and build a DI suite and went, went a totally different direction. Uh, and then, uh, the gentleman I worked with in Florida, John Carafin was this amazingly brilliant young guy. And, uh, you know, we stayed in touch and, you know, after DD and he went to real D for a while, wrote some patents and, um, then went to this company called Lytro up in Mountain View. Yeah. And, and uh, the Lytro had made the first, the world's first commercialized light field camera. Yep planoptic camera they used to call it the butter stick it was a small i do remember yeah um so from a photography standpoint it kind of put set the you know photography world on end with the technology and ren uh stanford grad he you know he put all this together and they formed this company and um so they'd come out with that and then it was cool because you could you know adjust the image after it was taken and i know you understand all 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 this but uh but for those that don't, you know, yeah, it's kind of, actually give people a refresher course on what a light field is. <laughs> well, well, a light field is basically, um, listen, around, around us at any time, the, re- the, the reason we're able to see is because wavelengths of light, photons of light are hitting off everything and, yep. you know, getting to our eye, you know, darker, our darker um, surfaces absorb light, uh, more reflective surfaces reflect light. And then we see color because of different wave wavelength amplitudes and different things. But that's how we see and we understand depth and different things. Very complicated. Um, uh, uh, if you want to dive in deep into the physics side of it. But but that, that's what's called that's what a light field is. So even uh, the, the traditional a traditional box camera from back in the day, you know, is a light field camera in a way that it's you know it's capturing you know some light right. basically. Uh, but traditionally, we've only you know put the light on a single image. Um, and the, the analogy I try to give people is. Uh, so a light field goes beyond a light field from a production standpoint and a light field capture standpoint. It goes beyond just a single image. It allows you to capture a volume of information from varying viewpoints, basically. Yep. Um, and I, I try to explain to people from a production standpoint, it's like pretend you had, uh, instead of a single image, you had a, a, the L.A. phone book, of those of you that remember the phone book. Yeah. And, and the single image is just one page of the phone book. Now you can go in and pick out any page right. that's slightly different depending on when it was captured at that time. So you have this large volume of data 
that you can now use and manipulate and pick different, you know, um, viewing perspectives from. But it's a uh, huge amount of data. <laughs> it's a massive amount of data. And yeah. this is, hence the problem, right. uh, the ch I should say the challenge, right? So, uh, uh, and you need, uh, you need sensors that can capture all this data, right? Yeah. So when you increase resolution, you increase sensor size. Right. The problem that Lytro was having was that um, uh, the, 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 to, to scale the cameras, because they made a, like a SLR kind of form factor camera a couple of years after that, mm -hmm. but it was still only HD, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people want to think that 2K, 4K, you know, special K, all the Ks, right? right. And, and, uh, and it, just, it just didn't make sense from a consumer standpoint in terms of electronics and the sensor and, you know, just a myriad of other things. So they pivoted to the professional market. Mm -hmm. And that's when John came in, John Carafin came in and said, you know, I can help you guys build a light field cinema camera. And so they had two verticals at that time that they were chasing. They were chasing cinema and then they were chasing um, the VR market mm -hmm. for light capture. Uh, and um, uh, so I, I was part of that cinema team. Um, and, uh, John and the leadership team on the, on the cinema side, you know, we, we built that camera. Those guys built that camera. It was huge. It, it was huge. It was the size of a small car and we debuted it at NAB and I, I kind of acted as a producer. We, we put a team together. We hired Robert Stromberg to, uh, direct and create a, a short mm -hmm. that, and then David Stump, uh, uh, Academy Award winning cinematographer, David, and who loves technology. So David and Robert, we brought them on and we did the short and we debuted it at NAB 2016, I think. Um, and it was groundbreaking, right. right? It was groundbreaking. But to your point, the camera's just too, I mean, the sensor was the size of a 27 inch Apple monitor, right. you know, on the surface. So it just, it was just, it was just really, really big. So um, without getting too deep into it, Google, you know, Long story short, Google ended up absorbing Lytro. Yep. And um, I, I don't know how they're integrating that technology, but the leadership team from Lytro Cinema spun off, which was Brendan Bevancy, Ed Ivey, and John Carafin to form Lightfield Lab, where I am today. Right. And I tell people, uh, people ask me, I say, well, I'm kind of at the other end of the donkey now. Which end? I don't know. But, right. you know, uh, Lytro was captured. Now we're at display. Right? You're at display. Okay. That was, that was, so, yeah. so, yeah, yeah. That was, that's a big thing. Like, how do you s visualize a light field? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And it's, it's, it's heavy lifting. It's very difficult. Sure. It's very difficult. But we've made tremendous strides. The company was founded in 2017. And we just closed our B round of funding, so uh, for fifty million. So that was that was a big milestone for us. Yes. So you know we're just right now we've proved the the technology. Um, we're projecting images, you know, off a of screen basically, both mm -hmm. off the screen and behind screen within certain volume parameters. Um, so now we're in the process of scaling it into. 28 inch panels that are analogous with the video wall industry. And it's how, and then you can kind of tie all these panels together. They're bezel-less can tile them together and, you know, form holographic images. So we're in the process of, of doing all that. Right so now. you're looking at making panels that you can see in 3d through these panels holographically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no glasses required. So. Okay. <laughs> this is yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. know you can't get into too many details, but yeah, I, we're on a pretty strict NDA on this stuff. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I'm not trying to overly promote, but just go to lightfieldlab.com sure. and uh, you can read about it. You can see we have example videos. We have two video examples that we shot of the display okay. on there. You can kind of see and and uh, now we're getting into interactivity and you know we're compliant with you know unreal and and uh, all the pre-rendered packages so you know the workflows are very similar yeah so uh, yeah so it's exciting um it's exciting and it's just it's 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 tough though it's tough tough physics stuff. so so i don't i don't know if you know this but i actually worked with the light field guys quite a bit through chaos <laughs> actually at some point oh, you did. yeah okay. so their their interest was to see you know obviously they can capture it through the camera but they wanted to try to create a cg uh uh twin of what they're doing right 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so because there's so many images, it was like we have to render thousands of images. And that was like, it takes a lot of energy to render all of the, those images to sort of mimic right. a light field. Uh, yeah. And But we were sort of working with trying to figure out the best method to do it. I got fascinated with light fields because I thought it's like, well, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, like a, a, you know, a, a capturing a, a geometry. It's capturing the actual light field because view-dependent things like reflections and refractions were correctly absorbed during light exactly. field. So I was like, this is, this is to me is like the pinnacle of where, you know, ray tracing needs to go in terms of capturing the light, as you mentioned, from a volume idea as opposed to a point idea, right? right. And right. so um, I got very fascinated. With it. And in fact, I even, we even did, when the technology got uh, sold to, to Google, I was working with Paul Bevick <laughs> to continue some of that stuff as well. Yeah. And yeah. we did, uh, we, we really got into some of that as well and sort of trying to understand what we can do. But the challenge I always had was like, this is, from a from a from a offline rendering point of view it was very impractical because of huge amounts of rendering and huge amounts of data <laughs> to deal with right. that stuff right. so but when during the ai revolution that started starting to happen suddenly the nerf idea started to come up and yeah. nerfs are basically smart light fields <laughs> yeah and, and i have you know we had you know, had a little email before this. Yeah, it's not my sweet spot, the right. nerfs. But I did, I did, I did check with our team on it a little bit more because I wanted to get their thoughts on it. Right. And um, uh, yes, uh, it it feels like they still have a, a ways to go, though. Sure. From, you know, right. But but you're you're absolutely correct in terms of what they are and the potential that they bring for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So so to me, I got very excited because you know all of the things that light fields. Uh, do which are really cool like being able to change things in post being able to see th- around things being able to to uh, uh, it's just it's just much more <laughs> what was who was the CTO of Lytro what was his name uh, well we had Kurt Akeley Kurt Akeley that's had- who I talked to yeah okay. I did a podcast with him about it right okay. and the great the great he's a smart guy he's yeah, a he's very smart yeah, he yeah, was yeah, one of the guys who founded SGI didn't he yeah, that's right. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he, he had the great analogy. It's like, once you have the light field, you're done. You have everything you need. <laughs> yeah. No, he's right. He's right. right. But it, it's then, to your point, though, because of the, the data hit, the amount of amounts of, of data, right. you know, what's the best way then to translate that so you can see it on the other side? Right. Right. And in real time, and you know, real time. And, and so on and so on. Right. Sure. And the new, the new engines, like, we're able to, we're, like, the examples we have, um, on the website, we have an example of a chameleon, and then we call it the Aztec head. Okay. The chameleon is, is pre-rendered. The chameleon is a pre-rendered through Maya. Right. right? Mm. And uh, But the Aztec head is through uh, Unreal. Right. So you can kind of see, see, see both. And, you know, having these real-time game engines, sorry, and then as we've um, integrate, integrated into our light field render engine, you know, it's just, it's amazing. You, you don't like when I first, you know, joined Lytro and, and, you know, even Lightfield Lab in the early days, I'm just thinking how, how, to your point, like how in God's name are we going to render all this stuff and any kind of reasonable facsimile that we'll be right. able to show him in any kind of compelling way. Cause but every can, frame was 2000 frames. <laughs> you can, and to your point, you know, the AI algorithms are helping that as well. Right? Yeah. Helping that one as well. So yeah, it's super exciting. I, I, it's, um, you know, uh, we're 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 definitely banking on it in terms of, um, um, uh, you know, the the things we're doing. We're super excited about the future as it relates to all this technology. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's same, same. Actually, uh, you know, at Chaos, obviously, we're 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 a big uh, our, our our the thing that keeps us excited is ray tracing, and this is this is. Through through some of the new AI nerf tools and stuff like that, and what a light field the potential is. Suddenly we're like, oh, we can make really cool light fields. Like somehow, like the that 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 spark has gone off uh, again. And thinking about uh, the the best ray tracing experience you can get as a as a as a light field or as or as a nerf or wherever that starts to cross, you know. Across, so yeah. uh, really yeah, excited. No. It, it is super exciting. It's super exciting. It's the future. We we also have some 
uh, uh, and we're not we're not saying we're there yet, but we have future vision application videos on the site as well. So okay. people are interested, they go in and kind of see if you know. A lot of times people are like, "Where would you use these?" And I was like, "Well, pretty much anywhere there's a display, you would use these." Right. Um, you know, it would be better. It'd be more compelling, yeah. more immersive. You know, all all the buzzwords, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I can imagine going through an airport and having a really nice that's display. Right. That's right. <laughs> Exactly right. Exactly and I was like, yeah, that's going to be compelling. The first time you see something like that, it's going to be like, what did I just see? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're going to see these things. And I think, you know, early installations will be in, like you said, like public spaces, mm -hmm. right? Museums, airports, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Uh, you know, theme parks, yep. you know, well, those kinds of things. Because the, the, other, the other thing, because one of the things I oversee at the company is content development for okay. the displays and for us. and. And at some point, I'd like to, you know, at some point in the future, I'd like to do some kind of seminar or have some uh, group consciousness on, um, you know, creating content for these displays because uh, it's different than a flat two D screen. Right? right. You when you start thinking about um, just editorial choices, sure, and camera choices, because now people can see it. It's almost more like a stage show than it is, right? Than a traditional 2D Absolutely. watching experience. And it's similar, I guess, to stereoscopic cinema in a way, but it's going to be better. Right? Oh, way better. And uh, you, you can move around it. <laughs> you, can move, you can move around it. But you are, you are limited to a, the, a screen. So right. one of the things that we have to explain to people a lot of times is that, you know, Hollywood's done such a magnificent job of, of highlighting um, uh, like Robert Downey being able to swipe holograms in front of his face and so yep. forth, nothing behind it. it physics doesn't work that way, no. right? So there always has to be a, a, a surface behind it, um, at least for the kinds of holograms that were, I mean, you can shoot things into clouds, lasers into clouds and, sure. you know, those kinds of things. But in terms of just a clean, a clean uh, hologram, you need a surface, uh, a, you know, line of sight surface. You always have to have that line of sight to the surface or mm -hmm. you can't see anything. Like they used to do those old uh, stereo 3D um, uh, campaigns of, you know, somebody reaching out to grab a football off the screen, right? right? understand that from a marketing standpoint but that would that, that just doesn't that can't happen in real life um, right. physics doesn't work that way so uh so those are other things that have to be considered so when you go off angle of a screen you're not going to see an object that's that side of it right, right. You, you, so that the way around that is you make multiple screens for multiple surfaces right, but right, one right. above one below on the side which is why the holodeck from star trek is the you know ultimate goal is to create a a, 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 a holiday. holiday that you can walk in because then you won't have any panel restrictions yeah um for edge of edge of screen right so i mean we're we're a, we're a ways off from that but that's you but know but that's what you're, you that's what you can see right now that's what you can see because then you're in then you're in you're in an environment where where no matter where you look, you're not obscured by an edge of screen. Right. Right. So now you can see the whole thing. Then, but then you get into occlusion issues and, you know, with people in the room, like how all that's, I, I don't know. This is why I'm saying it. Sure. At some point it'd be fun to put some kind of panel or seminar together about these new technologies that are being developed and how content creators are going to create content for them. I remember when I was uh, working with, uh, with Google uh, in terms of their, 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 looking into light field stuff what was interesting is that they thought the we uh, one of uh, an artist i work with his name is ian spriggs and he does very photorealistic humans like very very photorealistic and he he's very inspired by by uh by uh art history and so every uh port he does portraits of humans uh and he did one of a uh, of uh some, some guy named scott eaton uh, holding holding a skull because it was kind of this 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 it's a long story, but it was a really cool thing. And I said, you know, that could turn into a quote unquote sculpture. And so we did a light field of that as a 3D light field. So it was cameras looking in like this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then we'd put, uh, we put it, put it in VR. And it was just the best to see yeah. that because 
You yeah. could see every hair. It was every hair was there, but it was all done as a light field. There was no geometry, right? right. But you could right. see every hair. You could see every pore. You could see the reflections change as you moved around him the, in his eyes and everything. Yeah. And it was just, I was like, this is the best VR thing I've seen, you know, because it looks so real. And it's like, ah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not geometry. It's a light field. <laughs> And, and that's what that's what Lytro was trying to do with their VR capture system. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything from that, but you know they were trying to do that. But again, just, but it's uh, amazing what you guys are doing screens because then it's like you don't have to put the headset on. <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, and and it's funny. We would uh, John and I would you know we would hit the studios up at Lytro, and uh, they were really fascinated by the technology. You know, right. the executives and so forth. But they were like, so where are we going to see this on? And we're like, yeah that that's being worked on it's not quite there yet it's it's really more of a at this point it's more of a post production tool right. um for being able to manipulate the image um uh uh more from a creative standpoint you know not being locked into if you're shooting a kid on set or an animal you can't quite get that shot or you thought you did you can you know dive deeper into the file to pull the the scene the shot that you want sure you know, out of it, which is Huge for creatives, but producers are just like, oh boy, <laughs> right? You know, you got right. another process to you know pay money for. So it's kind of funny. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll listen. Uh, I'll you know, obviously we'll put a link to to uh, your site on on the podcast episode page. Uh, okay. Love to, love people to follow f- uh, up and see all that cool technology. And I can't wait to find to see what you guys are up to. <laughs> I've been sort of hearing rumors of it from the side. Is like I really want to. Jeff is doing so, but thanks so yeah, much for really, coming on and, and being yeah, able to talk about you should it. Really get, you should really get John Carafin on. He's the he's the brilliant mind behind it. Actually. Okay, I'd love to have him on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I'll mention it too. So. All right. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.